अच्छा नहीं आता हे सेशन सुरू झालं राहुल हा हा ठीक आहे नंतर बोलू आपण हॅलो येस हॅलो वी कॅन हिअर यू सर ओके थँक्स वेरी मच Am I on time or I missed something? Uh, Sheikh, nothing has started yet. All right. Is this Tina? Yes, Sheikh, okay. how are you? You are the star of the day today. I have been following you in the morning as well. I sent you something. Did you see? Yeah, uh, no, I haven't. I sent you something on WhatsApp. See it later when you go home. Okay, I will have a look. I'm in two places right, right now so it's hard for me to concentrate on anyone. No problem. You are most welcome and you are the star yeah. of the day. I think the stroke <laughs> is also going on, na? In Africa. Yes, it's going on right now. Yeah. Yes. So Raj Shakir has joined the uh, uh, good afternoon uh, Dr. Raj the uh, good evening Dr. Katrak. Good evening. I think uh, except for Dr. Uh, uh dr mishra has he joined no dr mishra has not joined and uh, and dr renaud has also not joined has david joined Because yeah david is asking not. for the pass code yeah i will call dr mishra हॅलो हॅलो हा डब्ल्यू एफ एन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी ऑल स्मॉल लेटर्स Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Suzanne? Hello? Hello. Uh, can we start now? Um, yes, I don't know where Reinhardt is, but um, he was, yesterday he told me he is definitely joining, so I'm not sure if he has, um, uh, you know, um, sorry, I don't know if he has a problem joining, but he was definitely uh, going to join. I'm online. Oh, hi. Hi, Suzanne. I'll 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 use another device with a camera. This my camera on this device doesn't work, but uh I'll, I'll join uh, in video as well. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. So now Dr. Mishra is also joining, so we can start now. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. There is a I think from today there is a problem with the password and uh, the, the the password is changed and uh, we have we are facing a lot of problems. Okay, welcome Dr. Mishra. Okay, so let let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, we, so, we should we should do it. Yeah, so we can start. Uh, Mansi, so start. Yes, sir. We can start. Uh, the room is already open. We have around uh, ninety-five uh, participants. Okay. 
Great. So yeah. welcome to, to today's uh, webinar. It's the second uh, in a series, and today we're discussing neuroinfections and uh, specifically TB meningitis. And so we have a number of speakers today. And um, without too much introduction, our first speaker will be um, will be yeah, uh, uh, Sus yeah, Suzanne David. Murray. David. David. Yes, sir. Yeah, just hold on uh, for a minute. Okay. I will start and then I will hand over the uh, uh, proceedings to you. Yeah. Uh, dear friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Buenas das, bonjour. On behalf of Tropical and Geographical Neurology, Specialty Group of World Federation of Neurology, Indian Academy of Neurology, and Forum for Indian Neurology Education, I welcome you all for this uh, second session of WFN Neuroinfection Series 2. The theme for today is uh, CNS tuberculosis, and it is the most important but the huge topic. And to enlighten us, we have eminent speakers. I welcome the speakers, uh, Dr. Suzanne Marais, uh, Dr. UK Mishra, Dr. Oshek Saidi, uh, Dr. Renaud uh, Van Crevel. Uh, Dr. Suzanne did all the hard work to organize this session. Thank you, Suzanne. This session is organized by Pan-Africa, Pan-Arab uh, region. I welcome Dr. Augustina Charve Feli, who is the president-elect of African Academy of Neurology and moderator for the session. To chair this session, we have uh, Professor David uh, Balwer. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, USA. He is an infectious disease uh, physician scientist with formal training in clinical trials public health, tropical medicine, and his primary research interest is meningitis in resource-limited areas, including diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and quality improvement initiatives. Current research uh, is focused on uh, improving the clinical outcomes of HIV-infected persons with cryptococcal and TB meningitis. And uh, for the last uh, 15 years, he's uh, in active research partnership in Uganda. Uh, he has led uh, numerous uh, multicenter randomized clinical trials in Africa. And uh, uh, he is uh, to NIH uh, HIV co infections and cancer study section uh, chair uh, for the last uh, two years. And warm welcome to Professor uh, David. In the room, we have the uh, to present the case, uh, Dr. Kate uh, McMillan from South Africa and welcome her. We have the past president of uh, WFN, uh, Professor Raj Shakir, uh, Secretary General of uh, WFN, uh, Professor Wilf Angrisol, uh, Professor Sarosh Katrak, uh, Secretary IN, Dr. Gagandeep Singh, Dr. Rahul Kulkarni. I will I am sure you will enjoy this session and the series. And now I hand over the the mic to Professor, the mic to Professor. David uh, and Professor Suzanne to carry further proceedings. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that very warm uh, introduction. So um, our first speaker today um, is Dr. Sus Suzanne Murray. She is a neurologist uh, from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She is one of the founding members of the, the TB Meningitis International Research uh, Consortium and has been working on TB meningitis for over 10 years, I'd say, what, 12, 13 years um, since your first publication. And she obtained a, a PhD uh, from UCT uh, back in 2014 uh, in South Africa. And um, she is uh, very well known for, the, for those who uh, work in the TB meningitis field. And I will turn it over to Su Suzanne. Thank you um, very much, David. Um, I'm just going to try and, and, and uh, Manashi, can you stop s uh, screen sharing? Okay, I'll share my screen now. Okay, hi, thank you so much for the invite to um, present today. Um, yeah, as was suggested, I, I work at Cape Town in Cape Town, and this is Grutteskeer Hospital, the hospital um, where I work, which is the tertiary referral center. 
So considering the other people's um, uh, talk topics, I'm going to focus on just shortly uh, one slide on the pathogenesis of TBM. Um, I spent some time discussing diagnosis, um, mentioned prognostic factors, and then so a few words on HIV-associated TB meningitis and TB meningitis immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So um, in developed countries, TB meningitis account for approximately one to 2% of TB cases. This is much higher in HIV associated TB, although we don't have exact figures because um, the documentation of, of cases are so poor, um, partly due to the difficulty in confirming the diagnosis. But in one study, 9% of HIV associated TB was um, TB meningitis. Now, for us who works in high HIV TB settings, um, TBM is a major cause of meningitis. In one study that we did in Cape Town, more than half of patients with meningitis fulfilled clinical criteria for TBM. Um, a conservative estimate is that there's around 100,000 cases per year globally. And a most important of this condition is its extreme poor prognosis, with mortalities reported between 30 and up to more than 50%. And just to, sorry, you probably can't see that whole um, um, graph, but um, even in optimal RCT circumstances, this is just a graph of uh, RCT performed in Vietnam, where patients were randomized to intensivize with the standard treatment. And even in that setting, the mortality overall was 28%, with an additional 10% being severely disabled at the end of treatment. Now, I'm not going to go too much into pathogenesis because there's still a lot that we don't understand. Um, so just a broad overview. Obviously, we inhale or people inhale TB. It causes pulmonary TB. And then various factors may contribute to dissemination of TB to other organs. Importantly, HIV immune suppression, such as diabetes, other than HIV, young age, host genotypes, and MTB strains. When the, the, the organism disseminates into the CNS, it obviously needs to cross the blood-brain barrier or the blood CSF barrier. Then small uh, conglomerated uh, granulomas are established called rich foci. And this happens in the meninges and in the sub um, um, cortical uh, areas. And these foci can rupture. Now this can either occur or dissemination can either occur with disease at the time of the primary infection or years later. And with the rupture of these foci, you get the release of this inflammatory cascade with cytokines, chemotractins, growth factors, proteases, and lipid metabol um, mediators being released. And you can also see an increase in um, neuronal injury markers and host metabolites. All of these, or um, some of these to some extent, causes then blood-brain barrier disruption with a further influx of um, white cells, lymphocytes, and neutrophils that further perpetuate this inflammatory cycle, resulting ultimately in meningitis, like you can see at the top there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this inflammation is usually most marked at the base of the brain can result in encephalitis, vasculitis, and rarely, but it does occur, ventriculitis. And um, these manifestations can then result in the complications that we see in TBM, including hydrocephalus, infarcts, and tuberculomas. Now, the, with regards to diagnosis, um, the majority of death occurs within weeks of diagnosis. And um, all of these factors have been shown to be associated with poor outcome, including worse disease grade, decreased Glasgow coma scale, prolonged symptom duration, and delayed treatment initiation, which um, strongly emphasize the fact that a rapid diagnosis is very important to improve outcome. 
but you have to weigh this up against inconvenience or harm caused by unnecessary treatment if you don't have a definitive diagnosis. Um, so this, this makes it quite tricky in some patients. Now, sometimes the clinic, clinical diagnosis is easy. TBM is typically um, a subacute uh, presenting meningitis with symptom duration between 10 to 30 days. The typical cerebrospinal fluid is known to, I think, most of us um, shows uh, usually a lymphocytic predominant um, leukocytosis. The protein is often or usually increased and the glucose is typically low. And brain imaging is helpful when it shows the typical changes, which can be a combination of any of the following, basal meningeal enhancement, hydrocephalus, tuberculoma, and infarcts. And then also very important in the clinical diagnosis is to look for features of TB elsewhere, such as pulmonary TB, lymph node TB, and abdominal TB in severely immunosuppressed patients. But there are several pitfalls in the clinical diagnosis, and this is especially the case for HIV-infected patients. So firstly, the symptoms can be very nonspecific, and the duration can mimic bacterial meningitis on the one side, or maybe months um, um, long. So it can mimic a dementing process. Furthermore, the CSF can be normal or mildly abnormal, especially, as I say, in the context of HIV, where up to 33% of patients um, can have normal cells. And this is specifically in severely immune suppressed patient, one study. Um, furthermore, the neutrophils can predominate. And a study from Vietnam showed that 63% of HIV infected TBM patients had an, um, a, a neutrophil predominance. And importantly, HIV itself can be associated with inflammatory changes. Up to 50% of patients without opportunistic infections can have some kind of um, either raised cells or raised protein or both. Seizures and stroke can be associated with inflammatory CSF changes and um, they might be mistaken for TB meningitis. In up to a third of, uh, in 30% of, in one study, patients with seizures who were subsequently not found to have an underlying cause for seizures had a pleocytosis, with more than half of these patients having a polymorph um, neutrophil predominance. And then, although brain imaging may be helpful if it is abnormal, it may be normal, especially early in the, the disease. And um, again, although extra CNS features of TB, TB is useful, it often happens that there is no other features of TB, which complicates the diagnosis. So considering this, how do we um, fare with regards to definitive rapid diagnostic tests, which obviously is important to improve outcome? Now, the most conventional method is smear microscopy through Ziel-Nielsen or Oramine. But in the most settings, and, and Vietnam is the exception, this um, is associated with the extremely low yield of making the diagnosis. Although, if this is your only option, it has been shown that large volumes of CSF and repeated LPs, as well as meticular microscopy for um, durations of 30 to 40 minutes, does significantly improve the diagnosis. But more promising is uh, the gene expert, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Initially, the expert MTB ref was um, endorsed by the WHO to be the first uh, rapid diagnostic test for TBM and later on the expert ultra um, took over this role. So these are um, real-time PCR methods, which gives you not only um, results within hours, but can also detect resistance to the ampersand. But expert sensitivity was still suboptimal, um, performing at 36 to 65% sensitivity versus a clinical case definition. And just to comment, these tests are, are very specific. Ultra, the newer version, has been improved through um, having a larger PCR reaction chamber and additional PCR probes. And in laboratory testing, it was shown that 
it has got a tenfold more sense, higher sensitivity, being able to detect 10 um, colony forming units versus the hundreds of experts. So how did um, ultra perform in, in clinical studies compared to expert and um, culture? So there's been three relatively large studies performed in Uganda, Vietnam, and India, where um, one study had only HIV positive patients, we had the others who presumably had a very few HIV positive patients in India. And both the Ugandan and Indian studies showed that ultra was significantly more sensitive than um, expert, having um, sensitivities of um, in the 70s um, compared to a clinical case definition. However, in Vietnam, they did not find that ultra was a more sensitive than expert. And this might relate in part to the number of insertion sequence copies that's, um, different, that, that's, uh, that ultra detects, which varies by um, TB strain. And this may account for differences in um, geographical reason, regions with regards to ultra's performance. But just to comment, even with these higher sensitivities, this is um, ultra is still not a good enough or a sensitive enough test to be used as a rule out test. So you cannot not start someone on TB treatment if the test is negative. And just to comment, because I think this is, um, well, this is widely available, the LAM assays, and it is cheap and easy and have potential to be of use. So LAM assays are usually used with uh, urine samples. It's lateral flow assays that detect the mi mycobacterial cell wall component, Libu Araminu Banan. And um, this is detected when um, a patient has disseminated TB, as I say, from the urine. So there are two um, versions that's um, commonly um, uh, available. And the first is the Allier LAM that uses polyclonal antibodies. And after initial tests, it was endorsed by the WHO specifically for HIV positive patients with CD4 count less than 100 because it's more sensitive, the more immune suppressed patients are, or in severe illness as it helped to make the diagnosis of TB faster and improve outcome. But um, when the Lear lamb was applied to TBM suspects and um, they tested the sensitivity both in urine and in CSF compared to um, uh, culture positivity, the sensitivity was um, markedly suboptimal being in the 20%. And this was also found in a small Ugandan study. But again, um, different manufacturers have come up with an um, improved version, the Fuji LAM, which uses monoclonal antibodies. And in addition, have a silver amplification step that results in better sensitivity. And it has thus far showed um, increased sensitivity in urine of TB samples, um, TB patients in general. But I think um, we need to um, keep this in the back of our mind because studies are currently being done looking at it in the context of TB meningitis. So just to conclude the diagnostic approach, I think it's often difficult to make the diagnosis and of course, Firstly, um, if a patient presents with simple symptoms of a meningitis to exclude other causes. I think it's reasonable in certain settings, especially in patients with HIV positive, um, who's HIV positive, who doesn't have other features of TB and where the CSF show mild inflammation um, to observe and maybe repeat the lumbar puncture. However, low glucose, should be a red flag because HIV itself very rarely causes a low CSF glucose. And then I think it's often overlooked to look for features of TB elsewhere. Patients don't need to have a cough to have miliary TB in their lungs and it does help and um, you know to, to steer you in the right direction. But the bottom line is to treat based on clinical assessment and not rely on a positive 
um, laboratory test, as no test is sensitive enough to be used, used as a rule out test. We're just leading into the next um, slide discussing HIV infection. So predictors of poor outcome, in addition to poor disease grade, is HIV is a strong predictor of poor outcome. Others include drug resistance with, um, because the, the drug resistance is just usually picked up too late to make a difference to prognosis. And um, Prof. Krevel is going to talk about treatment and um, how that relates to outcome. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. High TB um, burden is also a predictor of poor outcome. And this has been shown in um, trials We culture positivity predicted death. And also a recent study from Uganda showed that with ultra, the um, cycle threshold, the lower the cycle threshold, which is an indication of higher TB burden, was associated with two week mortality. Um, the next thing is that, interestingly, both hypo and hyperinflammatory phenotypes is associated with um, poor outcomes. So both low leukocyte counts as well as high neutrophil counts has been um, shown to be um, associated with poor outcome. And I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Human um, polymorphisms can also play a role there, there, and it is being investigated further in trials. And then I'm also not going to speak about complications because Prof. Misra is going to talk about strokes and um, hyponatremia. So just looking at HIV. Um, so the clinical presentation is, is similar or is the same as in HIV uninfected patients. Although, as I mentioned, they, uh, patients can have more frequent atypical CSF findings and then this definitive worse outcome. So um, this trial that was, again, the trial with, of intensified treatment looked at 468 HIV uninfected and 349 HIV infected patients. And the HIV infected patients did have access to ART, the mortality was double that um, in HIV compared to HIV uninfected patients. So um, these patients are at, at much higher risk of, of dying. Um, an important question considering these findings is when to start ART in HIV associated TBM, particularly because in HIV, V patients with TBM, risk factors for mortality has been repeatedly shown as being lower CD4 count at diagnosis. And some studies has also shown that not receiving ART at presentation results into worse outcome. Now in extra CNS TB, three large trials have convincingly showed that there is a modality benefit with starting antiretroviral therapy within two to four weeks in patients with CD4 counts less than 50. But this has not been shown for TBM patients. The only trial that looked at um, time of starting IRT in TBM was a trial in Vietnam that compared immediate, i.e. within seven days versus delayed IRT i.e. at two months in, in um, patients with TBM. Uh, the primary outcome was mortality at nine months follow-up and they randomized 253 patients. Now these patients were all severely immune suppressed with the median CD4 count being 40 cells um, per microliter. And this study did not find any difference between immediate and delayed ART but they did find that patients had more grade for adverse event in the immediate group. We, so we don't know yet. Also, these patients or the, this study group is not necessarily general, generalizable because they, are, they were so immune suppressed and not all patients with TBM have got that degree of immune suppression. 
Now, one thing to consider in um, the context of HIV-associated TB meningitis and outcome is TB iris. So TB iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome is basically reflects um, uh, excessive immune response to TB antigens in the context of a recovering immune system. And just shortly, you get two kinds, the unmasking type, when patients are not diagnosed with TB, they initiate ART and they de develop subsequently clinical findings of TB or um, so in, in CNS TB, findings of TB meningitis. Whereas paradoxical TB iris, and this is the, the type that um, most studies have looked at, is when TB is diagnosed and treated and patients improve, but subsequent ART results or is followed then by clinical deterioration that's not explained by another um, organism or um, illness. And this is the paradoxical TB iris. And what has been shown repeatedly also in the extra CNS TB studies is that a shorter duration between starting TB treatment and ART um, is associated with the increased risk of TB iris. So just, I know um, many of you will say yes, but paradoxical reactions also occur outside of the context of HIV, which is true, but repeated studies have shown that paradoxical TB reaction occur more commonly in HIV. In all TB cases, um, the adjusted odds ratios um, for HIV co-infection was 5.05. And when looking at TB and specifically, um, HIV infected patients had developed um, a paradoxical reaction 25% of cases compared to 2%. And in high TB HIV setting, paradoxical TB iris is very common. In one study performed in Cape Town, we found that 12% of TB iris cases had neurological TB iris. Another study showed that almost a quarter of patients who deteriorated um, with CNS issues within the first year of heart had T uh, neurological TB iris. And then in an another study where we enrolled patients at TBM diagnosis and started ART two weeks later, almost half of them developed neurological TB iris. And, and this uh, condition is associated with a significant mortality of between 13 and 30%. And this is just to show you how, pe how people might pre present. So they present with this unusual, very inflammatory um, manifestations and, and atypical manifestations, as you can see on the two slides on the right, where they can have this very focal um, inflammation involving their brains. And we looked if we could see what predicted development of neurological TB iris and what we saw was that patients, and you, here you have the iris patients in red and the non-iris in blue. So at TBM diagnosis, patients who subsequently developed iris had um, a much higher um, uh, proportion of these patients cultured TB from their CSA. 15 out of 16 iris patients compared to only six out of 18 non-iris patients. And at Two week follow up when their lumbar puncture was repeated, seven of these patients were still culture positive. And after another two weeks, which was the median time of developing iris, another two patients were still culture positive. And these were with susceptible strains. So it weren't drug resistant um, strains. And another um, um, risk factor is high neutrophil counts at initial TBM presentation. So patients who subsequently developed um, TBM iris had a median neutrophil count of 50 at presentation compared to three in the non-iris group. So this just alarm bell should go off in patients with HIV associated TBM that has not initiated ART yet, that these patients are um, highly susceptible to developing um, uh, iris. So how do we manage these patients? So 
With regards to prevention, I spoke about timing of ART in South Africa. The national guidelines suggest delaying ART in all DBM patients with HIV to four to six weeks because of the, um, the, the problem of, of or the danger of TBM iris. The steroids help to prevent well in non neurological TB patients, steroids did prevent the onset of iris, but in TB meningitis, more than half of the patient in our study that developed iris were on steroids at time of deterioration. So it did not prevent iris, but because currently there's still a there is a debate about where, where the steroids work in HIV associated TBM and, and Prof. Van Krebel will speak about this, but because the WHO still suggests giving steroids to all, we continue to prescribe steroids in, um, in HIV associated DBM. Education is important um, to warn patients that they might feel worse and not to stop the ART or the TB drugs if this happened, but to present to, um, to care, especially those with, who seems to have a high bacterial load and very um, neutrophil predominant CSA. And then the management, importantly, HIV patients can have multiple infections at the same time to firstly make sure this is due to um, iris and not due to a second or a third infection. We do, you do use steroids, although there's no randomized trial evidence for it, but anecdotal reports have shown it benefit and also a trial in non cns -TB has shown a benefit of steroids in mild to moderate TB iris. It's important to continue the ART and only interrupt ART um, if the patient has severe um, disease, because if you interrupt ART, you'll have to restart it at some stage and the patient might represent with the iris episode. And then there's also um, other drugs are being studied like the lidamide, which has shown um, promising results in um, both paradoxical reactions as well as iris cases with um, steroid resistant tuberculoma specifically. So I just want to um, finish my, my talk with, by concluding that TBM is a devastating disease that continues to pose significant diagnostic challenges and, and we are still looking for better um, rule out tests to um, be more effective in making an early um, correct diagnosis. And then um, HIV co-infection co increases your challenges. And um, we also need further research in, in that respect to inform better management practices. And but with this, I'd like to thank you and just show you um, this is um, our international TBM consortium that meets every few years to discuss um, new advances and new uh, think of new research questions that's um, important for TBM management. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Kate McMillan, who's the senior registrar in our neurology division, um, just to present a case that we recently see um, uh, around which we can discuss some of the issues with regards to TBM. I'm just going to um, share another screen. Um, it should be there, just to look at the bottom. Make it smaller. Close mine. Oh, there we go. Still, still need to share. Hang on. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to present a short case from Protescue Hospital that highlights um, some of the complications of TB meningitis, as well as um, some of the practicalities of diagnosis of TB meningitis in a clinical setting. So our case is a 30-year-old gentleman who was admitted to Protescue Hospital. He's previously very well, studying financial management, no known chronic medical conditions, and no TB contacts that he was aware of. And when he was admitted to hospital, he reported about a two week history of headaches, malaise and fevers. He hadn't presented to his general practitioner or any traditional healer and hadn't taken any recent prescription medication or oral antibiotics. And he woke up on a Friday morning with right sided weakness, predominantly in his face and arm more than his leg and difficulty speaking. On his examination on arrival in the emergency unit, his temperature was 38.4, his pulse was 90 beats per minute and regular, and his blood pressure was normal. His general examination, cardiovascular, respiratory, and abdominal examination were normal, and his neurological examination was notable for the presence of significant meningism. He was not drowsy or confused, but had an expressive dysphagia, as well as a right upper motor neuron facial weakness and a right spastic hemiparesis. His sensation was normal, his coordination was normal on the left, and his gait was deferred at that time due to the right hemiplegia. He had a non-contrasted CT brain on admission, and this showed subtle hypodensities in the left frontoparietal and insular regions, as well as features of early and mild hydrocephalus. He had some initial investigations, and his blood showed that he was HIV negative. This was by ELISA. He was non-reactive for treponema pallidum antibodies. His white cell count was normal at 6.84, but he had a low serum sodium, which was 122. He had CSF on that same day, which showed a significantly low glucose of 0.8. His protein was high at 1.43, and he had very high polymorphs of 1,273 with 117 lymphocytes. Bacterial culture, cryptococcal antigen test, and viral studies sent on that CSF were negative. A TB culture was also sent, as well as a 16S RNA PCR, which came back ne negative about 10 to 14 days um, later. He was admitted to the general medical ward and um, he was treated as a complicated bacterial meningitis with IVI keftriaxone. And this decision was based upon primarily upon the very high neutrophil count and the neutrophil predominance in his CSF. And the history of the two week history of the headaches and the fever was less clear at that time. On about day two of admission, he unfortunately developed flaccid lower limb weakness with a T10 sensory level and bladder involvement. He had an urgent non-contrasted lumbar spine MRI, which is shown here on your, the right of your screen, um, which was reported as normal. And the next day had a repeat CSF which was day three then of IVI antibiotics. His glucose um, had come up to 2.1. The protein was much the same at 1.35. The polymorphs had decreased by about 75% and the lymphocytes also were decreased to 42. A gene expert was done on that CSF and mycobacterium tuberculosis complex was not detected. We were then consulted to review the patient, and while his pyrexia had initially settled on IVI antibiotics, he unfortunately had become more significantly meningitic, as well as having a recurrent fever on day 11 of antibiotics. We found that he had a mild expressive dysphagia, but with some improvement in his right upper limb weakness. There was a flaccid lower limb weakness with a power MRC grade of 3 to 4 minus out of 5, and then he had a T10 sensory level to pinprick and light touch, with abnormal proprioception in his lower limbs. He also had a urinary catheter in situ due to ongoing um, bladder problems. And our concern at that stage that this was not, in fact, this had been mistakenly called a complicated bacterial meningitis. And we thought this was in fact a tuberculous meningitis, which had been complicated by stroke as well as an acute myelopathy. We then repeated CSF on day 11 of admission. And you can see here that the glucose had actually normalized to 2.4. The protein was still elevated at 1.8. The polymorphs had doubled again to 656 with lymphocytes of 67. And a bacterial meningitis PCR was done on that CSF, which came back negative. We then asked for repeat um, imaging, and we obtained an MRI with gadolinium enhancement. And you can see here um, 
the, the, the top arrow on the left shows um, meningeal enhancement, most of the anterior cord, as well as a more plaque-like enhancement around T5, T6 um, in the thoracic cord. And on the right image, you see a, an, an image of the lumbar spine, it's T1 with GAD contrast, which shows quite avid enhancement of the chorda equina. We also obtained um, an MRI of his brain, which shows um, quite extensive contrast enhancement in the left sylvian fissure, as well as the left basal ganglia. Now the clinical outcome of this patient, um, after we'd obtained this imaging and the third CSF, his admission CSF TB culture came back positive at 12 days. And he was commenced on TB treatment and concomitant corticosteroids. And he actually did very well. He was discharged with resolution of his dysphasia and upper limb weakness, and he was ambulating independently. When we reviewed him at eight months post-discharge, he had normal sphincter function. He had five out of five power in his upper and lower limbs with minimal spasticity, and his sensation was improving. And we wanted to just quickly present this, this case of TB meningitis in an HIV negative patient to highlight some, uh, some of the points in terms of, of diagnosis and some of the complications. And the first point is that one should always have a very high index of suspicion for TB meningitis with a subacute history. This gentleman had complained of two weeks of headaches, malaise, and fevers. Um, and, and then again, he also, it was complicated by a stroke and my, myelopathy, which is more characteristic for TB meningitis rather than an acute complicated bacterial meningitis. The second point to make is that CSF and TBM can be highly variable. It can prevent with, present with elevated neutrophils, um, even a neutrophil predominance. And although Dr. Maria mentioned that this is more common in HIV positive patients, it can be um, also true for HIV negative patients. And another point to make is that the pleocytosis may fluctuate with serial um, lumbar punctures, even without appropriate treatment. A, a third point to make, which Dr. Murray has already made, is that the gene expert, unfortunately, is still not a good rule-out test. Even the um, more sensitive gene expert ultra is not 100% sensitive, and a negative gene expert should certainly not, in the correct clinical setting, dissuade someone from starting um, treatment for TB meningitis. And lastly, just to point out that when requesting neuroimaging for suspected TB meningitis, one should preferably ask for pre and post contrast imaging to show meningeal pathology. In this gentleman, it is only with the addition of gadolinium that the um, quite significant meningeal pathology in both his brain and spine um, was shown. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Um, our next speaker, we're going to change the schedule slightly from what was published beforehand. And so our next speaker is, is uh, going to be Dr. Professor uh, Mishra. And so Professor uh, Mishra, as you get your slides up, hopefully. Um, he uh, is a professor of neurology at the Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences in Lucknow, India. Um, Dr. Uh, Mishra is a prolific uh, author. He's published more than 462 papers. Um, and over 11,000 citations. Uh, and a lot of that work has been on, on TB and TB meningitis. Uh, he's an author of four books. Uh, and he has previously, his initial clinical training was, was diverse as well um, with um, training experiences in, in Italy, Sweden, and the, U and the United States. Uh, and uh, he was um, kind enough to be our host in, uh, for the last um, international TB uh, meningitis consortium meeting in Lucknow. And so we were all uh, very pleased to visit Lucknow. And uh, he's, uh, today, uh, Professor Mishra is going to speak on TB meningitis uh, complications. Full, full screen there. May I start? Uh, yes, please. Good, good afternoon. Yes, May I start? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I uh, thank the organizers and uh, Professor Dr. Suzanne for giving me this opportunity.
I'll be presenting on complications of TB meningitis and their importance in outcome. Uh, while we treat a patient with TB meningitis, uh, several complications occur, and they are seizures. Uh, patient may require mechanical ventilation. There may be paradoxical worsening, hyponatremia, stroke, drug-induced hepatitis, and many others. Many of these complications are a compensatory phenomena, and they may be interrelated, and they have not been evaluated in a single cohort. And then what are the treatment strategies? To begin with, I will share a case of 35 years old male who complained of fever and headache for four months. He had tonic-clonic seizures, um, which lasted uh, for, uh, for three minutes, one month back. There was positive tuberculosis, and he was some doubtful treatment he received, we are not sure. He was admitted with five month history of uh, continue um, and uh, was given uh, four drug antitubercular treatment based on CSF and gen expert uh, results. He was okay for 15 days and then developed hyponatremia. 10 days later, he became irritable, drowsy, had walking difficulty and drowsiness. A CT scan revealed hydrocephalus, which is shown in this slide here, and your thalamic infarct, which is not shown here. External ventricular drainage and VP shunt were done, and he improved. And his GCS was 15, and he's okay for a week. Then, 10 days later, he became drowsy, and his serum sodium was 120 um, milliequivalent per liter. And his he had some polyuria, 2.7 liter of urine and 2.7 liter of intake. MRI revealed uh, basal exudate, tuberculoma, and ventriculitis. He was given dexamethasone and uh, dimox, and he improved within a week. Then, six months later, you know, one month later, in uh, you know, in five months we were talking, now it is one month later, he had tachypnea, acidosis, and had respiratory suppression, had to be mechanically ventilated. Two days of mechanical ventilation. He improved, but he developed drug-induced hepatitis. His SGPT was 111 unit. After dexamethasone and antitubercular treatment, his GCS improved and he was extubated. So this patient, at between five to six months, developed hydrocephalus, infarct, salt wasting, tuberculoma, then needed mechanical ventilation, and respiratory acidosis because of aggravated by acetazolamide. So this shows that so many complications appear in same patient in a short time. One of the important complications was paradoxical worsening, which was uh, mentioned by Dr. Suzanne. We looked at 34 cases of proven tuberculous, tuberculous meningitis. And out of them, we learned that tuberculomas, either enlargement or a new tuberculoma were seen in 18 patients at three months and four patients at six months. Similarly, exudates out of 20, they increased in eight patients and another two patients at six months. Hydrocephalus also increased and uh, was showing a paradoxical worsening in seven at three months and one more patient at six months. This is the picture of a patient who was showing initial MRI scan, increasing tuberculomas, and further increase in tuberculomas at six, six months. So tuberculomas, after stabilization of one month of uh, antitubercular treatment, they occurred in our study in 65%. And corresponding clinical worsening was noted in half of these patients only. So the, to, the paradoxical worsening is maximum at three months. Hydrocephalus, it occurred in 23, exudates in 16, and stroke in 6% patients in this study. Infarction in TB meningitis are also common and occur because of vasculitis, because of uh, exudates uh, compressing the uh, basal vessels, or sometimes stretched by the enlarged ventricles. And moreover, we have recently learned that they may be because of hypoperfusion produced by polyuria and cerebral salt wasting. When we looked at our data of stroke in TB meningitis, tuberculosis zone infarctions were seen in the anterior part, that is the anterior limb, genome, and anterior thalamus. And these patients did not have any uh, you know, uh, stroke, conventional stroke risk factors. 
whereas ischemic zone inf infarctions, which were seen in the posterior limb, were associated with conventional stroke risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Majority of stroke and TB meningitis patients are asymptomatic and they are in, in two third patients they are missed unless we do an imaging. And they can occur at any stage of TB meningitis. Interesting where the border zone infarction. So these are some of the pictures. You can see the basal exudates here and, 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 and the corresponding infarctions. This is the infarction in the caudate and anterior region, which is we call it tubercular zone. In cerebral salt wasting, there is excessive polyuria and patient has a negative fluid balance. And we feel that the hypoperfusion occurs in these patients, which may contribute to, inf to, to, to stroke or infarction in these patients. This is the picture. This lower picture shows the border zone infarctions. The internal border zone is here. And these, you can see the infarctions here. And in the upper part, we have seen 10 out of 16 patients had developed infarcts during the polyuric phase of cerebral salt wasting. This is the onset and this is the end of polyuria. These graphs, lower part is the onset and upper part is the end of uh, uh, polyuria in these patients. And the, in the center, the red part is showing the timing of infarction. So you can see that in majority of patients, the infarcts occur during the polyuric phase of cerebral salt wasting. And we feel that it may be because of associated hypoperfusion. This is the blood supply of the brain and the blood supply, when we compare uh, the, the pressure gradient, if the brachial artery pressure in one study was 192 by 130 millimeter mercury, the perforators had a blood pressure, much lower blood pressure, 113 by 75, and parietal blood pressure was 60 by 38. So there is a gradient of pressure. And if there is hypoperfusion, if there is hypotension because of negative fluid balance, these collaterals can suffer and there may be infarct in the internal border zone. This slide shows the pathogenesis of stroke and TB meningitis. These are exudates, the basal exudates, vasculitis, of course, we, we very well know, and hypotension, and then there may be a state of prothrombotic state. Any infection can lead to a prothrombotic condition. So in this study, we concluded that hyponatremia is common in TB meningitis, most commonly due to uh, cerebral salt wasting, and so cerebral salt wasting may contribute to border zone infarction. This slide shows to you the, uh, some uh, comments on the prothrombotic state in pulmonary tuberculosis, which leads to DVT. Similarly, in another study in which uh, they looked at the prothrombotic profile and they found that there was decreased anticoagulant activity by low protein S, increased procoagulant status by factor 8 and plasma is an activator inhibitor, and uh, there was decreased fibrinolytic activity and increased platelet count during the treatment. Uh, there was because of IL-6. And most marked changes were seen in second and third stage TB meningitis. And these changes reversed after when saw in a sequential follow-up study uh, when, the treat, when the patient was treated. So therefore, stroke in TB meningitis can be because of a prothrombotic condition besides hypoperfusion, what I have been telling you. And this study summarizes the three trials of aspirin in TB meningitis. This study, 60, uh, 59 patients each, and this showed that um, uh, stroke incidence was reduced and three-month mo three mortality was reduced in one study. Dr. Showman's study, 50 patients, 46 patients, 49 patients, uh, control and low-dose and high-dose aspirin were uh, observed. And what was seen, there was no survival benefit, but hemiplegia was reduced in the patients who are receiving high-dose aspirin. And Dr. Thoyt's study also confirm the benefit of uh, by reducing stroke in confirmed cases of TB meningitis. So now we are using aspirin in the patients with TB meningitis if there's no contraindication. Cheezers are also an important uh, complication in TB meningitis and they occur in 30 to 40% of patients. And they may be because of cerebral edema, meningeal irritation, raised integral pressure, hydrocephalus, stroke, and tuberculoma. This is an Indian study by, by Dr. Patwari, in which he reported uh, seizures in 74% uh, four, four cases in high, because maybe mainly pediatric patients, and they were generally tonic, clonic, focal, and, to and tonic seizures, and the cause of convulsions are mentioned in this slide. 
in our study, out of 27 patients in this slide, um, in this study, we found that focal scissors were seen in 12 patients. Focal with uh, bilateral uh, scissors were seen in uh, eight patients, and uh, um, and uh, generalized scissors were seen in, in seven patients. So these were 27 patient developed scissors in our study out of 79 patients. And the etiology of scissors in these patients was meningeal irritation, tuberculoma, infarctions, hydrocephalus, and miscellaneous causes. This study compares the uh, uh, compares the clinical and demographic features in the patient with and without scissors and doesn't show a significant difference uh, in this uh, slide. But uh, what was the, 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 the mortality was not reduced, uh, not changed, but uh, the outcome was definitely worse in the patient with scissors. And there may be scissors in the early stage or late stage. And uh, the causes of late scissors were tuberculoma, exudates, and hyponatremia and cerebral salt wasting, whereas early scissors were mainly because of meningeal irritation. And six patients had status epilepticus. Their duration of status is mentioned in this slide. And one of these patients had status epilepticus, refractory status epilepticus, and had to be treated by 3% and normal saline. And in other patients, the cause of status is uh, shown in this slide. They have tuberculoma, hydrocephalus, actually multiple causes are shown in this slide. And they required uh, one anti-epileptic drug in 17, two in five, and three anti-epileptic drugs in, 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 in a few patients. This is a patient who had his infarct and he had a post-stroke seizure, a left focal seizure, during uh, hospital stay and he was treated. This is another patient who was treated RHZEL, four drugs per levofloxacin. And he had, um, um, he had a left hemianopia because of granuloma and he developed seizures. So there were two causes for seizures, levofloxacin and uh, a stroke. And here you can see the granulomas which are uh, seen in this patient uh, on contrast enhanced, you can see large granulomas with, uh, in the occipital region, uh, posterior parietal occipital region, and which are responsible for seizures. So we stopped levofloxacin, uh, gave uh, levetiracetam, clobazam, uh, acetazolamide, uh, manitol glycerol, and he improved. And he was given uh, four drug antitubercular treatment with 30 milligram prednisone. This is the hyponatremia producing status epilepticus in TB meningitis. His, uh, he, uh, the, his clinical uh, picture has been shown 45 year old man uh, diagnosed with tuberculous meningitis. Uh, <clears throat> he had developed salt wasting. His sodium was 109 and it required 3% saline and had to be uh, mechanically ventilated, but he improved. This is a patient with paradoxical worsening. He had uh, tuberculomas and he had status epilepticus lasting for four hours. This is the initial um, uh, MRI scan. And uh, at the time of uh, seizures, you can see paradoxical worsening, multiple tuberculomas and exudates in this patient. Uh, this is a study by Dr. Barucha from Bombay. He noted, uh, um, also noted paradoxical worsening and seizures. And here he compared paradoxical worsening and no paradoxical worsening. In paradoxical worsening, seizures were present in 26%. Uh, and in patients with paradoxical worsening, they were seen in 41% patients. These are paradoxical worsening with seizures. And in his study, he found that those who had abnormal CT scan out of 136, they were uh, 63 patients with abnormal CT scan, 38 with normal CT scan, and uh, and there were 36 patients who had normal CT scan and no. Uh, and you can see Schizer's recurrence has been shown in red color. There was no significant difference, suggesting there are multiple causes of Schizer's in TB meningitis. So Schizer's occurred in 34% patients with TB meningitis. They're common in children. Schizer's are of different types and they are multifactorial, raised intracranial pressure, hyponatremia, and drugs, and provoked seizures should be treated for a short time. Tuberculoma, infarct, hydrocephalus may require long-term treatment. It's also a common complications and uh, occurs because of isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide. But you know, is it drug toxicity or something else? Because in all the patients, we are able to restore antitubercular treatment. If it is a toxicity, then it should 
on challenge, it should produce re repeat drug toxic, re repeat hepatitis or hepatic dysfunction, which it doesn't in majority of patients. So uh, we looked at our, uh, we, you know, and we find that uh, uh, drug induced uh, hepatitis occurs in much lower frequency in extras, uh, in uh, extra serious tuberculosis. Um, uh, in like parsa spine or permanent tuberculosis, where it's much higher in TB meningitis. And in our study, we found that it occurred in 43% of patients, 22 out of 67 patients. And it was related to glasogoma scale, stage of TB meningitis, SARS, CRP, and ESR. And with paradoxical worsening, it occurred in half the patients. So we felt that it was related to the severity of meningitis, rather than drug toxicity per se. And this slide shows that glasocoma scale and stage of TB meningitis were significantly related to drug-induced hepatitis. And the lower graph shows to you the, the, the similar pattern in, um, between paradoxical worsening and drug-induced hepatitis. They run almost in half the patients they were together. So in TB meningitis, uh, drug-induced hepatitis occurs in 44% patients. It seems to be related to stress. We looked at uh, uh, cortisol levels also, but uh, they did not appear significant because of the wide variation of the cortisol levels. And, uh, <clears throat> and in all the patients, we when we introduce these drugs sequentially, we are able to restore in majority of patients, about 90% of patients. We also have looked at the method of treating uh, hyponatremia with, uh, with the fluidrocortisone, and we found that hyponatremia can be treated earlier or the serum sodium levels improve faster if you use fluidrocortisone. However, the duration of polyuria and other parameters are not affected, nor is the mortality affected by use of fluidrocortisone. And these are the sodium levels in fluidrocortisone and in no non fluidocortisone group, and you can see the higher levels in fluidocortisone arm. And these are the sodium levels in fluidocortisone and no fluidocortisone arm showing better, higher sodium levels. And use of fluidocortisone is associated with hypokalemia, left uh, ventricular failure, and uh, hypertension uh, in uh, some patients, and therefore we have to be cautious. So fluidocortisone resulted in earlier improvement of serum sodium, Protocortisone is well tolerated. Uh, prevent internal bortezone infarctions because the, the frequency was lower, all the cases were small in number. And protocortisone does not affect polyuria or outcome of TBM patients. Now we wanted to see that what is the proportion of these complications in a single cohort. And that we did in a retrospective analysis of 144 patients. And we define the clinical paradoxical worsening, hydrocephalus, stroke, et cetera, by using clear criteria. And then hyponatremia was also defined. And then drug-induced hepatitis, we also defined using standard criteria. And, uh, and, and, the, and the status epilepticus and respiratory suppression requiring mechanical ventilation. We ventilated our patients when there were blood gas changes, not just for prevention of aspiration or altered sensorium. I mean, because this is what we have been following. And, uh, and, uh, and we decided the outcome, the three month outcome. And there were majority of patients with stage two or stage three. And this slide uh, shows the comparison of patients who died and survived. And, <clears throat> and we, we found that uh, infarction, uh, paradoxical worsening and hyponatremia were uh, significantly related uh, to the mortality. Uh, similarly, drug-induced hepatitis, schizers, mechanical ventilation, hydrocephalus were also significantly altered. In multivariate analysis, uh, paradoxical worsening, hyponatremia, and mechanical ventilation, in fact, were uh, the um, predictors of outcome. These are different complications. Uh, their overlap is shown in this slide. What is the timing of these complications? You can see majority of these complications occurred in the first month, that is infarction, um, hyponatremia, drug-induced hepatitis, mechanical ventilation, they all occur mainly in the first month of treatment. Whereas can clinical paradoxical worsening, of course, occurs later because you need one month of stabilization to diagnose this. And of course, mechanical ventilation occurs also later. So most of the complications occur within a month 
uh, infarct, hyponatremia, drug-induced hepatitis, and mechanical ventilation. One third of infarctions uh, occur on admission, and some occur later on. Majority of clinical paradoxical worsening occurs in the third month. And of course, more the complications, worse the outcome. There is no, uh, no, not surprising. So complications occurred in 88.9%, 89% of our patients, mainly occurred in the first month. In fact, hyponatremia, clinical paradoxical worsening, mechanical ventilation predicted poor outcome. Well, mechanical ventilation is a poor outcome, or it is since it is used in very severe patient, therefore it is, um, it is uh, stated as a poor outcome predictor. Status epilepticus, hydrocephalus, and uh, DIH did not figure as a significant predictors in this study. More complications have worse outcome. And clinical paradoxical worsening is a, 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 a composite of stroke, uh, is attributed to stroke, tuberculoma, accelerate hydrocephalus, and, sh and is managed by the steroid. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Sudan, you are going to invite the next speaker. Yes, our next speaker. Can we have his CV up, please, Prof. Uh, Prof. Saidi? Okay, I'm very um, thankful to uh, invite Prof. Um, Saidi to uh, or to introduce Prof. Saidi, who's a professor of neurology and internal medicine at the University of Khartoum in Sudan, um, where he's a senior consultant neurologist at um, Soba University Hospital, and is also a senior consultant neurologist in um, Riyadh. He was a previously a consultant neurologist in the UK, and he was also a clinical research associate at King's College. And he um, was a founding member and vice president of um, the, sorry, now I've lost my, my slide. Hello? Hello, yes, I'm following you. Oh, sorry. Now I just lost my slide, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt myself then. Please, please continue. It's all right. So shall I make a start? Hello? Yes, yes, please. yes. Yes, please start. Shall I just make a start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation. And what she wanted to say, I'm one of the founding members of the African Academy of Neurology, which I feel proud of and proud to see that they are um, invited in this session as well. And uh, we are very happy with the collaboration we are getting for from um, both the World Federation and from FINE. Uh, I have been saved a lot by my previous two colleagues, <clears throat> Professor Suzanne and Professor Misra, with their uh, comprehensive experience. And probably they made my life easy. So probably I'll go into uh, filling gaps into the clinical presentations of, of, of um, um, tuberculosis of the nervous system other than uh, tuberculous meningitis. These are very interlinked conditions. So I might be touching in and out um, on what they have already said. I don't have anything to disclose. Although this is a very busy slide, I will probably not go in everything, but it's for the benefit of those who want to review um, what else apart from tuberculosis meningitis. So the central nervous system is the most known for people, but many don't give much attention to involvement of the peripheral nervous system, which I will also touch on and probably show you some, uh, show you one very rare case. So I'll talk about tuberculomata, or some people like to call tuberculomas, and TB brain abscesses, cerebral vasculitis, and angiitis already has been touched on by my previous colleagues, tuberculous cerebritis. TB in the spinal cord could be post disease, which everybody knows, but it could be also less um, known variants of radiculomyelitis, and non-osseous spinal tuberculomas, and chronic spinal arachnoiditis.
Uh, TB of the orbit and the retina also is interesting and useful clinically. And in the peripheral nervous system, you can see granulomata on the peripheral nerves, entrapment which can involve cranial nerves and can involve the radicals in the spine or directly on the peripheral nerves, either from the direct process or from the cold abscesses. I'll show you a rare case of lump over some peripheral nerves, which I believe I did not see it in the literature before, and I hope you will uh, some people will have an input on that. The complications have been ex expertly covered by, by Professor Misra, and uh, they are either of the disease, but I will touch on hydrocephalus. Other associated disorders that have been covered, absolutely fantastic, iris, HIV immune status. So I will not indulge into that at all. I will not talk about the atypical mycobacteria, and I will hint on what we expect in the future. This is our hospital. So University Hospital in the outskirts of Khartoum was donated by the Soviet Union in the 1975 as a hospital for tuberculosis, and then evolved gradually into the tertiary care center, University Hospital, with multiple specialties. And I'm sure some of the audience they have already visited uh, this. So tuberculomata, they can occur in the context of tuberculous meningitis, or could be the sole presentation of involvement of the nervous system by tuberculosis, particularly in immune competent patients. I don't see much patients of HIV, but I see other immune competent, which are not immune competent, but they are HIV negative. Particularly, we see a lot of refugees in Sudan and internally displaced people due to the raveling um, civil wars around, around Sudan. I'm sure people do see this in other parts of the world. And I think refugees and internally displaced and malnutrition and the gap in, in food in the world is going to cause more and more cases of tuberculosis. So it's not only treating TB, but treating the social circumstances might be the way for the world. The epidemiology in many of the countries is not very accurate, but estimates go from five to 10% of patients with tuberculosis have extra pulmonary, and those with masses in the brain, five to 30%, they have tuberculosis. So it's a quite important problem, and it's well shown in the global tuberculosis report by the WHO. It's available, and I'm, I'm sure you will go through it. The clinical approach to patients with tuberculosis and other Parts, I think, for the benefit of trainees and benefit of um, those who um, don't see much patients, particularly our colleagues in, in, in the developed world. So they have to consider the language barrier. Somebody's coming from India or from Africa. Sometimes they don't give very good history. So it's important to get an interpreter and also mind the local body language. Because if I move my head from side to side in Sudan, it means no, while this causes problem because it is absolute yes in India. So. Usually the symptoms are headache, fever, local symptoms. CJS has mentioned previously and change in mental state it could be just confusion in state or even the patient might come in a state of coma. So you have to be very careful on the spectrum of the presentation, but a high index of suspicion should be kept in. So patients who lost weight unexpectedly or they have night sweats or they have unexpected. I saw many patients who just came with neck pain and night sweats and then turned to have tuberculometer. Close to this is the very young and the very elderly, and as I mentioned, uh, the other groups of. In the West, probably those with alcoholism and those who are homeless are high risk of tuberculosis and keep an eye open on this. So not easy sometimes to diagnose just from the history and even with the investigations as Professor uh, Susan mentioned. So prison mates in the West and probably travel history, it's important to ask people about exposure to contact with open cases or if they have lived or originate from a high prevalence area. And this is important for our colleagues. So you, you are not immune from seeing very funny cases with tuberculomata in any part of the world, in all populations. In the physical examination, if you see wasted patient with temperature or altered consciousness, meningeal signs are usually minimal in patients with tuberculomata, though you can see them with with um, TB meningitis. I did not try the new head jolt test. Probably we'll, uh, Professor Ash Shakir uh, might comment on the use of uh, head jolt in patient with suspected meningitis later. And the signs go from high up down. Fundal examination is important because it can show tuberculosis or resin tracheal but you see papilledema. You, sometimes you observe a local focal seizure and I call that 
a vivid sign. You see, focal seizure probably, even if the initial scan is, not, is normal with fever and sweats, you have to suspect in the right context involvement with tuberculosis as in tuberculoma. And the, and the address goes without comments from me because of focal signs. General examination might give you a clue, but not all patients who are having extra pulmonary will have very vivid or clear chest signs. So even if there are no other signs, it is still you have to consider this. The, the differential diagnosis goes with the infection, infectious causes, but non-infectious causes should also be considered because not all patients come in with this, even with the fever and night sweats. So think of partially treated meningitis. In our context, sometimes patients just go to the primary care center, get antibiotics for a week or two, and then they come two or three months later with partial treated meningitis or even longer than this. Brucellosis is a great mimicker of tuberculosis. So not all patients coming with these are only tuberculosis. I did not see any patient with co-infection with brucellosis and tuberculosis, and I would like to hear from people. Keep in mind fungal, spirochetal, and other agents. Probably I'll, when I show one of the cases, I'll tell you what I think of another differential also, which people should consider. Recurrent uh, viral infections like, particularly also we see patients who use very strong, powerful immune modulator medications for multiple sclerosis or for other um, gastrointestinal or rheumatological conditions, and they come with PML, so JC virus screening, and even sometimes it's very difficult, even with the, with, with the investigations. Tumors, either primary or secondary, particularly cystic astrocytoma and gelaplasoma multiforme. I'll show you one case of possible meningioma, lymphoma, leukemia invading the central nervous system or involving the retina might be like that. Elderly patients coming with headache, elderly lady, as they do have high SR, don't forget, GSL arthritis could be the cause rather than tuberculosis. But the CSF will help in such cases. Non-infectious vasculitis involving the central nervous system, radiation cerebritis and angiitis, demyelinating disorders, even multiple sclerosis in our context, sometimes we don't suspect it, and in, we, it's rare in, in the environment of Saharan Africa. So we do see lesions which enhance, but these are actually due to tuberculosis. In other places, or even in Africa, still MS is there, so not every lesion you see in that context should go only for tuberculosis, particularly if the other tests are negative and the CSF was clear. So I saw one patient with tuberous sclerosis, CT scan with, 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 with contrast, typical of tuberculosis, started on the tuberculosis therapy, but when seeing the patient, actually the patient has classical skin manifestations of tuberous sclerosis, so that was stopped and the patient was told that's not tuberculosis. Basic blood tests can help, particularly the ESR and the CRP, because they might be raised. I will not indulge into the hematological manifestations of TB, but HIV test is important. CSF routine already being covered, and I will not comment on the microbiological tests. Imaging is important. It's not available in all contexts, but a CT scan with contrast might answer in, might give the answer in many cases. MRI and MR spectroscopy, when there's difficulty, between differentiation between a tumor and this, I will show uh, some evidence for that. Not to forget dura sign thrombosis sometimes, patient with red tracheal pressure or even hydrocephalus. If you do see this common contrast, you might see uh, that there are clots in, in the sinuses as a complication. Tissue, CSF is a tissue or biopsies from lesions. Sometimes we are stuck. We don't know whether this is tuberculum or this is a tumor or something else and might need to go for a biopsy. This is done in very few centers, and I'm sure it's not very available in many of our countries. Uh, the, somebody asked about the Mantu test or the PPD or the uh, intradermal test. The intradermal test is not very helpful in patients who are immune compromised, but in immune competent patients, in about 50% of the patients are strongly positive to, to the extent that you, it's more than three millimeters. Some Records say this might indicate active infection. Honestly, I don't do it. I don't think it's very valuable. It might be helpful in population studies to know the prevalence of the positivity, but I don't think in individual case, it will make you sure enough to commit the patient on a prolonged and not uh, without this medication um, for, a, for a long period. 
So Procella testing, and I remind people if it comes negative in a context, for example, now I practice in Saudi Arabia, people do drink raw camel milk sometimes, or goat milk, and you think it's tuberculosis, but if you do Procella test, it comes negative, unless you mention to the laboratory, we need in high dilution, which will overcome the Brozon phenomenon, Lyme disease and, and the other vasculitis. So one point I want to raise for, for, for uh, trainees uh, that when not to do a lumbar puncture, it's easy to say any patient suspected, we do a lumbar puncture. I remind all these colleagues, lumbar puncture is safe in the house when it is selected properly, and it should be done in every patient suspected to have CNS infection. But if there are focal signs, or the patient is unconscious, or there is papilledema, you have to be extremely careful. And you do imaging. After doing imaging, if it conf confirms the presence of a space occupying lesion or midline shift, then you cannot do a lumbar puncture because the risk of coning is high. And as I mentioned, neurosurgical services are not at hand. So probably that might be killing to the patient rather than the disease. And I always go for empiric antituberculous uh, uh, therapy without any uh, delay. Uh, so be careful. So tuberculometer with the, C, with the MRI scan, you see big lesions, and usually they have strong ring enhancing. So we always remember the, the mnemonic of uh, MAGIC, which is uh, the differential diagnosis basically of brain ring enhancing lesions. And I'm sure everybody has gone through this previously. Sometimes it is mimicking meningioma, which is based on the surface. And the clue to that is not enhancing uniformly. And there was massive edema around it. And it has a core which has re reflecting different iso parts being iso, in iso intense, while others are hyper and hypo. So this is the clue to, to, to this, but in the right context of having the clinical features of fever, night sweats, or weight loss, and very thin enhancing. I think this also comes from the great India. Uh, I won't go into the details of MR, MRS and I'll leave it for those who are talking about the diagnosis, but there is a lipid peak in patients with tuberculoma. This is not conclusive. We had difficulties sometimes with MR, MRS spectroscopy, although they say a single peak at 3.8 pp per, per uh, as potential marker to differentiate them from malignant tumors. Uh, honestly, um, sometimes it is very difficult and uh, we go by empiric or for biopsy. Also, when there are multiple tuberculomata, you have to consider your cystic causes. Again, say magnetic resonance imaging and a spectroscopy might help and the peak of lipid and also reduction in the choline and uh, N-acetyl uh, aspartate peaks might help to differentiate. Um, this is this is studies um, shared from Sudan and two of my colleagues, Tajuddin Sokarab and uh, Mohammed Najib, they participated to 24 new cases and they, with, with using uh, spectroscopy. And uh, again, they also used blood flow studies. It did help in some of the cases, but here you can see this mass crossing the midline. So whether it is glioblastoma multiform or not, then in these cases, they claim this will help spectroscopy and the flow. Um, again, we have to make our students and our trainees aware about all these possibilities. Uh, goals over tubercular brain abscess, the differences between tubercular abscesses and granuloma are not great, but the center of the abscess is not reactive. It's a liquefied center with a thin wall. Usually it can, occur in any part of the brain, but predilection to the centrum semi ovale and the brain stem. So it can present with fever, headache, and present acute pressure, obviously, by obstructing the CSF and causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Again, you don't need to take biopsy from this. And if there's midline shift, probably a lumbar puncture might not be possible. Again, I won't repeat saying that we look for the urine test and how sensitive it will be and, and implement it in many of the patients. Hopefully it will be also available and supported by WHO or other organizations or TB campaigns 
to make it available. The problem is this abscess is corruption into the ventricular system and cause severe uh, ventriculitis. And this is a devastating condition, which will also cause hydrocephalus. And most of the patients who rupture in the ventricular system, they passed away. I saw around 20 cases or so. I think all, almost 18 of them um, passed away. And sometimes it's also difficult to differentiate tuberculosis from biogenic. Again, MR spectroscopy. And they say the peak of lactate is higher in patients with biogenic rather than this. And um, when it is very difficult, patients are started on beric antibiotics for conventional biogenic abscess. If no response, then they are changed in my context to antituberculous therapy. I think this is very risky. We still look for easier non-invasive diagnostic tests to differentiate, differentiate between the two because MR spectroscopy, again, I don't think it's available in many parts of, of sub-Saharan Africa or in rural India or in the poor parts of the world where tuberculosis is more, more common. I always say um, uh, it doesn't look like anywhere in the world the confluence of the blue and the white knights in Khartoum. And uh, this is an invitation for all of you to, 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 to come to Sudan and, and, and see it yourself. Um, tuberculosis of the orbit, it affects the bone, the soft tissue in the orbit or the retina itself. So there are many case reports of patients having involvement of the bone only. So plain X-ray showed destruction of the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, and later an ultrasound showed that there was an abscess dragging there and causing compression. So they can come with six nerve palsy, combined six nerve or um, cavernous sinus syndrome or proptosis as in this patient. So keep an eye for the possibility of tuberculosis. Plain X-ray in the rural areas or in the uh, resource limited areas will, 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 will give an answer. Tubercle, Coroidal tubercles more seen with middle tuberculosis now with a sophisticated test and they are raised and uh, they could give clue to the diagnosis if you see a patient who are very sick with pulmonary tuberculosis or in an area of high prevalence, probably this is basic uh, clinical skill and it will answer difficult cases sometimes. So there are clinical significance. They denote that the patient probably has middle tuberculosis and we see them rarely in immune competent patients. Uh, bilateral, more with these, and again, these are our visitors to the department. And tuberculous cerebral vasculitis is a devastating sequelae of tuberculous meningitis and has already been mentioned by Professor Mizra, but it could be direct involvement or it is the immune response, as in the iris syndrome. Many patients who came like this, actually this happened after the patient was started on tuberculous therapy. Not only this, he mentioned also the stroke, and it's worth also mentioning that some patients who want to start with antituberculosis develop adrenal crisis. They become severely hypotensive plus other factors. So an eye should be kept open about cerebral vasculitis um, complicating tuberculomatous. This, this patient had dural sinus thrombosis, blocked the left transverse sinus. The question here and the problem we face is the interaction between antituberculous therapy and the anticoagulants, particularly warfarin. So the balance is difficult, but we usually go for both and monitor the patient's IRR closely. Uh, tuberculous uh, rhombencephalitis probably um, happens in the context of tuberculomata within the brainstem, which is not very clear evident with initial investigations, but it is not an entity which I'm very comfortable saying that it exists on its own. I think it's always in the context of TB meningitis or tuberculomata, and I would love to hear from other colleagues. So. Mixing it also with rhombicephalitis caused by listeria in immune compromised patients or in young or elderly. I think one should keep an eye, but CSF in listeria is characteristic. And I think the blood glucose will be low in both of them. So we have to do uh, the listeria staining and, and PCR uh, probably. If not, we add uh, an, a penicillin to the, to the antitubal therapy if one is stuck. Um, tuberculosis of the spine, famous, everybody knows about, and usually, it is either osseous or non-osseous, so it can be the bone being involved in the juxta disc areas with cold abscesses and collapse, probably it's mechanical. It can involve the blood vessels are called vasculitis, local vasculitis, venulitis, or involvement of the, um, the subdural venous plexus, spinal venous plexus. It can also be caused by direct involvement of the spinal cord, so it is non-osseous involvement. And chronic spinal arachnoiditis,
um, cause chronic low back pain, but the clue is in the right context, high risk areas, fatigue, weight loss, and night sweats, one has to consider this. And MRI is usually very characteristic without an involvement of the disc or the bone. I won't go into the differential of this. Peripheral nerve granulometer has been reported, but it's quite rare. And this patient, this is the root, this is the right sural nerve biopsy. Somebody came with um, pain and dropped foot and uh, all steroids and all this did not work much, much than, and the patient improved on antitubercular therapy. The clue was the patient had tuberculosis in the past few years before. So one has to ask about history of exposure. Entrapment neuromas is secondary tubercular abscesses. It's very known this uh, South syndrome can compress the femoral nerve or the quina. And this is the little case which I have seen myself. Um, and initially, I thought this is not tuberculosis. And you will see the video. The video is very well. Does, does, it, does it play well, the video? Did, did the video play well? This is the lower part of the ring. This is the face. So, they are much together. And aspiration was very positive for us in the fast passing line. MRI showed only one disc involvement, and the rest was a soft tissue mass which did not liquefy. But this is, I could not find any such case in the literature. So, it, the abscess dragged across the intercostal nerves and the patient was generally well without give us and for it sometimes he responded very well to antitubercular therapy with steroids and the lesions resolved so i won't talk about the management in details but antimicrobial also the general care nutrition for the patient is important and osmotherapy has been mentioned already and early rehabilitation. I think early rehabilitation is also very important in our context. It does not need very sophisticated uh, interventions, but sometimes also we need the help from the surgeons as in abscess drainage, oxygen biopsies, spinal decompression, or reconstruction with bone, bone grafts. Complications of the disease, and this I have been mentioned, hydrocephalus will be either communicating or non-communicating. The non-communicating is usually complicating some uh, subarachnoid block due to the involvement of the meninges and the arachnoid villi, the subarachnoid space by the pus material, more around the brain stem. Non-communicating, direct obstruction, as, as, as I mentioned. Durasana's involvement will also raise the intracranial pressure. And I will not also go in details of this. Hydrocephalus in tuberculosis could be either with this or reaction to the start as part of the paradoxical response to antituberculosis. So, Sometimes the patient have a small tuberculomata. You start the treatment, the patient develops hydrocephalus. So it's either being close to the aqueduct of Sylvius or the post ventricle, or probably at the um, foramen of Monroe. Probably you know the fish gone, uh, the fish um, 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 focus of the primary could be in the arachnoid uh, spaces of the ventricular system. Again, it needs intervention. Paradoxically, you have all already been mentioned several times. Tuberculous radiculomyelitis, as part of IRS, has been mentioned by Professor Suzanne, and they have shown their own case. This one I got from the literature, and again, it shows almost the same as the case presented. So it could be reaction, it could be both obstruction due to mechanical and IRS. These patients who are having terminal involvement or conus involvement in the context of Sudan always think of Bilharzia. So we give them prazocontil dose, which doesn't have much side effects. But we did see in young patients, particularly who they swim in the canals, they come with corner syndrome and urinary tension, and they don't respond to antituberculosis, but when given uh, antibilharzia. So teamwork, more awareness, more courses, and networks will be the way forward. I think the general awareness, BCG vaccination for patients, I think now BCG is not given in the West, but in our context should be emphasized that we, we do this and I will look forward also for the new therapies. I'm, I'm just wondering why not people think of lesser drugs like one or two medications for, for, for mycobacteria. I, I would like to hear from others and more sophisticated tests which non-invasive particularly in the urine or the saliva or whatever to give advanced neurosurgical stereotactic also 
and endoscopic uh, relief is not available in our context. Target rehabilitation, this is target rehabilitation in a patient in a rural part of Sudan is paraplegic and there are no paved roads. So what we did, we got this wheelchair and we connected it to, to an ass. And actually he had a tuberculosis therapy and he's back working and he is the breadwinner for a big family. We, we, we showed this in, in general practice neurology. Also campaigns, fighting patients with wheelchairs. We also asked the organ, civil organization to help. And uh, now I would like to call if people agree with me for a task force against neurotuberculosis. And probably I will leave this in your safe hands. And this is the seventh uh, European Academy of Neurology, the regional training course in Khartoum 2015, where all these um, elites came and educated us about many part of them was about tuberculosis of the nervous system. And the way forward is collaboration. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I hope I delivered something of meaning to you. Again, Soba, Pyramids in Sudan, and the lovely confluence of the Niles. Thank you so much for uh, listening uh, to me. And uh, I repeat my gratitude to those who organized uh, this meeting. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Sheikh. Um, our last speaker is uh, Professor Reinhard van Krebel. Um, Dr. Uh, van Krebel is from uh, Radboud uh, Medical, University Medical Center in uh, Nijmegen in um, the Netherlands. And he is a professor of global health and infectious diseases. He is an awesome honorary professor at Oxford University and at the University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Uh, he's worked for over two decades in uh, TB and HIV in Indonesia. Uh, in uh, Bandung and, and elsewhere. And um, he has led a number of, of really critical uh, foundational uh, trials that have advanced our knowledge, uh, particularly with high dose rifampin, uh, which he's, I, I'm sure he's gonna talk about and um, some critical phase two trials and that are headed onwards to phase three trials. So I will uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Professor Van Krebel. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak at this um, event. Um, so I will focus on the management of TB meningitis. I'm a physician in the Netherlands. We don't have a lot of TB. Um, and sometimes when we do have a patient with TB meningitis, um, it's, um, it's a rare thing. And so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not diagnosed uh, timely. So let's start with this patient, a typical uh, patient in the Netherlands, maybe. This is an Indonesian master student who presents with a progressive headache through a general practitioner. Um, he doesn't realize that there might potentially be a, uh, an infection ongoing. She returns with progressive symptoms, is finally after several weeks sent to the emergency room where she's diagnosed with meningitis, started on ceftriaxone and amoxy and, uh, and acyclovir steroids and antiemetics, she uh, shows some improvement, is discharged and returns with, uh, again, worsening of her, uh, of her um, clinical picture. And then six weeks into illness, she finally ends up um, with a diagnosis of TB meningitis. And if you look at the three lumbar punctures that were performed, they're all, uh, so moderate elevated to cell count and a low glucose, uh, I mean, I think in TB endemic settings, this would never happen. But as I said, in the Netherlands, it's rare. So a doctor may never see TB meningitis in his life. When we got to uh, know this, uh, this young woman, she also had bilateral uh, lung lesions, which uh, with hindsight on the first chest x-ray might have already been uh, suspected. Um, I, uh, I also, uh, as, uh, as David mentioned, uh, work with uh, colleagues in Indonesia and as I said, this would not happen in Jakarta because half of the patients, this is just a, an, uh, a group of HIV negative patients, but the same is true for the HIV positives. Half of the patients there will uh, presenting with a brain infection will have TB. So really the very first step of, of management is diagnosed, timely diagnosed. Uh, which depends on several things and we've heard of a lot of this, uh, this afternoon, obviously. So the first uh, thing is the clinical assessment. So this young woman, she was treated for suspected bacterial meningitis, but obviously this was not a b acute bacterial meningitis. This was a subacute, slowly progressive illness. 
the non-neurological clues, so lung lesions, lymph nodes, my very first patient of TB meningitis in the Netherlands, I made it diagnosed before the lumbar puncture was performed um, by aspirating um, uh, pus from a uh, superative axillary lymph node. So um, the second, of course, is exposure and epidemiology. So an Indonesian master student in the Netherlands, we should think of TB as she comes from a TB uh, endemic country. Then, of course, immune status. So we should not just look at uh, every patient with a suspected brain infection should get an HIV test and we should look for other reasons why there might be an immune deficiency. The routine CSF, so opening pressure, cells, glucose, protein, we've heard that. Um, and then, of course, we have the microbiological testing. If you want to prove TB, please use a large volume for your culture and microscopy. And then there's the radiology that may help you. So, um, and just one slide uh, we've heard on alternative cases. Uh, so in the Netherlands, maybe one or two percent of, of uh, brain infections is TB. And so when someone presents with a subacute illness um, uh, and fever, um, we think of many possible infections, and, uh, but there's also non-infectious inflammatory causes of, of such an illness. One thing that I find particularly hard to distinguish from TB meningitis is neurosarcoid. Sarcoid. Okay, so this is the first component of, of proper management of TB meningitis, early recognition and diagnosis. Then the second is the antibiotic treatment. And please keep in mind, starting TB drugs uh, should not be delayed if you really suspect it's TB meningitis. And this is a bit different from pulmonary TB, obviously. When it comes to the regimen, we follow the model for pulmonary TB with a standard four drug regimen, even though the penetration of some of the drugs, especially rifampicin into the brain and the CSF is low. So that made us wonder about 10 years ago or a bit longer, um, whether we should increase the dose of rifampicin or whether we should uh, add drugs that, uh, that are more potent and have good uh, cerebral penetration. So with uh, colleagues, Dr. Rizal on the left and Dr. And Pofnina on the right in Bandung, Indonesia, we performed this phase two study where for the first two weeks of treatment of TB meningitis, we administered a slightly higher dose of rifampicin intravenously. And this resulted in about two to three fold higher exposure to rifampicin, both in blood and cerebral spinal fluid. And as you can see here in the survival curve, um, blue is the standard uh, outcome. And as you see, a, a very high mortality. And with this high dose rifampicin in this group, which was mostly HIV negative, the, um, the mortality was, uh, was much lower. Um, and this is a much bigger study from Vietnam um, that also examined intensified antibiotic treatment, uh, which was given for the first two months. And uh, only in a subgroup of INH resistant patients, um, there was a... Um, a benefit of this intensified treatment. Now, what could be the reason why these two studies show different results? Well, maybe it's a matter of dose. So we've performed three studies in Indonesia, three clinical trials, and um, um, uh, modeling the data, the outcome data from these trials, older patients have a higher risk of dying. Patients with a lower Glasgow coma scale have a higher risk of dying and patients with a lower exposure, so with lower drug levels of rifampicin have a higher chance of dying. And if you realize that in this curve, the standard dose uh, results in this exposure here on the left, you see there's a lot uh, possible gain in increasing the exposure of, to rifampicin. So from this mathematical modeling, um, the tripling the dose of uh, rifampicin uh, would result in a, in a quite significant uh, survival benefit. And that's exactly what we are doing. So with your moderator, Dave Bulwer, and your first uh, speaker, Suzanne Murray in, in South Africa, friends in Uganda um, and, uh, and partners on our partners in Indonesia, we'll be um, uh, recruiting and randomizing 500 patients to a high dose of uh, rifampicin. This is just one of several studies that are examining this high dose rifampicin in a phase three um, uh, design. Then besides the antibiotic, inflammation is important. Um, so here on the left, you see graphs that fever, so patients presenting with, a, with, a, with fever have a worse outcome 
patients with a high blood neutrophil count, the same is true actually also for a high CSF neutrophil count, Suzanne already alluded to that, they have a much worse outcome. And you see the quite dramatic and, and variable immunopathology in these patients. So clearly we need to address this inflammation if we want to improve outcome. And um, of course, we've been doing that for a long time, corticosteroids, the strongest evidence coming from a trial in, in Vietnam that was published over 15 years ago. But as you can see from this study, which followed the patient from this trial uh, for five years, the effect is, is most uh, pronounced for patients with mild or moderate disease, and the effect seems to wane over time. And there's also not a no effect on neurological disability. And as a matter of fact, there's no proven effect on HIV. The trial for HIV infected uh, patients to see if corticosteroids help is currently ongoing in Vietnam and Japan. So corticosteroids is, is maybe not the only answer. Maybe we should be looking for other drugs and Misa already alluded to aspirin. So this is the, um, is the outcome data on, uh, on Guy Trace's uh, trial phase two trial where a low dose sort of antiplatelet and a high dose anti-inflammatory aspirin were, were compared with placebo and where you see that the high dose aspirin was associated with lower death and a lower rate of new infarctions. Still this study was underpowered to really prove that this was different and, and other studies are now examining if, uh, if aspirin is beneficial. But maybe we should also not just go for our our candidate drugs, but take a more unbiased approach to understand the immunopathology and TB meningitis. So we have used metabolomics on cerebral spinal fluid, measuring hundreds and hundreds of metabolites to see what metabolites correlate with outcome and if we could, uh, if that could help us understand uh, disease. Now, one of the metabolites that really st um, stood out was tryptophan. So tryptophan is a nutrient from mycobacteria and it also has immunomodulatory and neuro damaging neuroprotective effects, this uh, tryptophan metabolism. So a very low tryptophan was associated with a much better patient outcome. More recently, we've also used proteomics um, uh, in of cerebral spinal fluid uh, and measuring almost hundred inflammatory proteins. One again stood out, MMP10, um, in a discovery and a validation cohort. And similar to the tryptophan, I didn't show it here, genetic loci that were associated with the level of this matrix metalloprotein. So it's a catalytic um, uh, protein, catalytic enzyme that is associated with tissue damage. Genetic loci that associate, that predict the level of MMP10, those genetic loci in another group of patients predicted outcome as well. And that suggests that this has a causal sort of contributory role. And now maybe we should further explore these type of, of markers to see how we could um, target uh, uh, disease and, and improve immunotherapy. Okay, so antibiotics, inflammation, and then the next important component is neurocritical and supportive care. And I just show a single slide from a beautiful paper published in Lancet Neurology last year where uh, there's a number of strategies you can, you can apply to, to maintain or to, uh, the right intracranial brain perfusion and, uh, and avoid um, high intracranial pressure. So obviously there's surgery, uh, shunts, um, um, but there's also uh, me uh, medical uh, drug treatment that we can use. Um, there's the ventilation, there's blood pressure, there is um, ensuring a, appropriate oxygenation, so monitoring the uh, avoiding anemia, uh, fluid treatment, all, all issues that were already addressed. And besides the neurocritical care, there's of course important supportive care. One thing that always strikes me, patients keep on dying. So they die in the first week, but then mortality remains considerable over treatment. And is that a result of aspiration or pressure source of, of catheter related problems, co-infections, deep venous thrombosis, and many of these issues need further study. Okay, we've already heard from Suzanne about HIV, so I will be very brief just to, uh, to re-emphasize that the diagnosis can be a bit more difficult, so the routine CSF can be sort of less abnormal. In my experience, the glucose is the most um, 
reliable marker in the HIV infected patient where, where pliocytosis may be absent. And in the HIV infected patient, there may be a broader differential. And sometimes your diagnosis of TB depends as much on your TB diagnostics as well as on excluding other causes. HIV is associated with a higher mortality. I told you about the steroids. Uh, Suzanne explained about the ART. And then there's the iris. I'll just, um, 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 uh, so she showed this difference between the paradoxical iris and the unmasking iris. And let me just show one impressive patient that we met last summer. So this is a patient who presented with a newly diagnosed HIV in the emergency room with, uh, with some nausea. He had some liver dysfunction and he had a very mild cough. Um, uh, he was uh, sent home with cotrimoxazole, didn't return to his outpatient visit, but only came back five weeks later in respiratory failure, you sort of straight went to ICU and you here see the dramatic uh, miliary uh, TB uh, picture. This was a, um, a fully sensitive MTB. He was started on TB drugs and someone decided to start ART very early and this is what followed. So a dramatic um, lung picture, progressive multi-organ failure and mechanical ventilation was almost impossible. Here you see the, the, the persistent uh, pneumothorax and subcutaneous emphysema. He suffered from co-infections, um, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, CMV. He suffered from an unmasking cerebral um, a TB that, um, uh, uh, that kept us busy. Um, and all this was refractory to corticosteroid treatment. And we decided then to target um, interleukin-1 using anakinra, which is good cerebral penetration to try and, and uh, reduce this uh, inflammation. The good news is this is eight months later. I find it remarkable the plasticity of the lungs that after so much TB, you can, you can end up with these lungs. So... This is a very typical sort of paradoxical uh, reactions. You start treatment and people get, uh, get more ill. Uh, we do also see it without HIV. So new radiological uh, findings, um, or clinical worsening, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, your inflammation um, uh, increasing. And sometimes this is refractory so steroids. So one, you find it difficult to taper the steroids, but even when you continue steroids, some patients um, do not improve. So this is an example of a patient that was referred to me after six months treatment for TB meningitis. It's an HIV negative African woman. She had a culture proven TB meningitis with a hemiparesis and um, she was treated and uh, the doctors in Belgium did not um, manage to taper the corticosteroids. So she came to us with uh, decreased consciousness and, and a remarkable cerebral spinal fluid finding this is a logarithmic scale. So the cells had, had increased quite considerably um, over six months time since she had this, this crazy uh, protein level in the cerebral spinal fluid. And um, I was not so concerned about microbiological failure. She had been treated under direct observation. And I thought about inflammation that was steroid refractory. And I added uh, anti-TNF and she clinically improved and the inflammation um, went down. So just to, um, uh, just to summarize, uh, so the key component in management is timely diagnose, obviously. Then there is, I think there's good reasons to believe that higher dose antibiotics are beneficial. Obviously, our neurocritical and supportive care are essential. And then uh, last but not least, we should, uh, we should target inflammation in TB meningitis. There's one factor that I should also mention, Dr. Dharma, my good friend in Jakarta, um, has worked, let's say, on the cascade of care. So, Unfortunately, many of our patients, they end up in the clinic very late with very advanced disease. And many things can go wrong along this pathway. So patients may not realize they have a brain infection. Um, or when they go and see a doctor, the doctor may not realize. We interviewed patients and their family members and many had, had gone to def, uh, different doctors, different clinics, but no one had suspected brain infection. Even when a doctor suspects brain infection, he or she may not, not perform a lumbar puncture or not have the diagnostics available or not have the treatment available. 
Dr. Dharma interviewed Indonesian neurologists, and I, and I think this situation is not unique for Indonesia. Unfortunately, many had, I, had not done lumbar punctures or thought that HIV was a contraindication or had no TB, had no rapid molecular test for TB or had no test for cryptococcus, had no drugs for cryptococcus. So many barriers uh, in uh, addressing treatment. Yeah. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And, uh, and my colleagues in, in Nijmegen and elsewhere um, for, um, for um, uh, collaborating on this uh, difficult but fascinating uh, topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reinhardt. That was great. Um, so we're to our question and answer um, part of the, the, the day here. And um, there's a number of questions that have been typed in. Uh, and we'll ask our panelists as well as um, some of the other um, uh, moderators from the World um, Federation of Neurology um, uh, to, to chime in as, as necessary. And so to pick off some of these questions um, in no particular order, but um, one question that came up was um, about uh, pleocytosis that fluctuates with serial LPs and even with appropriate treatment as, as they're on therapy, the white count may go up. Uh, and what, what, what does one do about that? So um, it, is a leukocyte count um, sort of an, an indicator for, for treatment success or failure? Uh, Suzanne, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, so I think what um, the most important thing to look at is the glucose. So especially if there is loculations in the subarachnoid space in the spine, you can access a pocket with, um, you know, with a different constitution constituents than if you went slightly below, slightly low. Also very high protein makes it very difficult to assess cell numbers adequately in many labs. So it will fluctuate. And I don't think that um, you should look at that, especially in the first few weeks of treatment, but the glucose should start to improve quite rapidly within days after um, effective TB treatment. And um, the protein and the cells can still be present quite a long time. And I think it's um, some of the Vietnam studies showed it quite nicely over time. Um, so clinically is the most um, uh, relevant way to assess a patient. I don't know, Rainut, if you have any other um, thoughts? No, I totally agree. Okay. Um, another question that came up was uh, regarding the type of steroid. So um, you know, the, the initial New England Journal uh, study by Thwaites used uh, dexamethasone, um, and that is available some places, but not, not all, certainly. And so um, what's your opinion on sort of the, the, the type of steroids? That, is that really important and the duration of steroids? Okay, again, I will, I will talk because we don't use the white regimen in South Africa, uh, mostly because um, we don't keep patients that long in for four to six weeks in, in a hospital. We just see too many sick TB patients to, to be able to, to do that. So we use um, prednisone at a starting dose of 1.5 milligram per kilogram per day. And we continue this based on clinical response. In someone with mild disease, we might consider decreasing after two weeks, otherwise over four weeks, often with patients with um, spinal involvement with um, severe inflammation, we we'll, may even decide to carry on longer and then reduce it gradually um, over time, depending on the clinical response. So for example, someone who does well, we'll give it for two to four weeks at 1.5 and then give it at 0.75 for two weeks and stop. Someone who's more severely affected, we might decide to reduce it after a month by 10 milligram per week. And if the patient then gets worse, then obviously go up again. But just to, um, you know, to keep remembering, if you didn't culture the organism, you should always consider drug resistance if the patient doesn't respond as expected. Uh, Professor Mishra, do you want to um, comment on your regiments in India? If you're there, oh, you're muted. But... Am I audible? 
Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, we use generally a small dose of prednisone. That is, we use 0.5 milligram per kilogram unless there is an emergency like herniation or a blindness or impending cord compression, we use small dose. And uh, we continue it for a month and then taper in the next month. Uh, if the patient, we do not think that, uh, you know, changing cell count is an important thing because, you know, we have done a sequential study and we find that patient may be clinically improving, but the cell count may not follow the improvement and vice versa. So we feel that CSF cell count and sugar, et cetera, are important for diagnosis. We have not found it very useful as a prognostic indicator. And um, we use steroid for two months. Unless emergency, we don't use higher dose, but rarely we use high dose or even if it's prednisolone, there's the impending visual impairment or herniation or something, but otherwise small dose of steroid. Because you know we have a lot of co-infections Patients come late, they may have infection, et cetera. Therefore, we are scared of secondary infection coming up. Therefore, we use smaller steroid. We prefer to use smaller steroid. Okay, thank you. And I would just comment, you know, for those in tropical locations or subtropical regions, you know, certainly the strongyloides, you know, chronic co-infection can be, can be present. And so it's something to screen for and empirically treat before you, you launch on a prolonged uh, course of uh, steroids uh, to prevent strongyloides hyperinfection, which, you know, where I work in Uganda, it's about 5% of the population is chronically infected in, south, in areas of sort of rural Southeast Asia that, that you know, rate can be even higher. Um, another question that, that came up was um, regarding iris. And so when paradoxical um, you know, tuberculomas pop up or paradoxical iris happens, um, what do you do with the drug management um, if you're into the consolidation phase? Um, you know, you've, you've already done your, your, your two months of, of four drug induction therapy. Um, what do you do with your steroids and with your um, your medications? And may I? May, yeah. See, my, with paradoxical worsening, we think that this uh, paradoxical name is paradoxical. In fact, we found that it occurs in about seventy, more than seventy-five percent of patients, and only half of them are symptomatic. So it is a very usual response of treatment, and it happens. We have observed it after a month. And if the patient is clinically fine, we follow it up with the same steroid. Yes, if there are indications of worsening, acute worsening, then we have to step up the dose of steroid and do other measures. But uh, we, we, we uh, think that uh, this name paradoxical should be now changed to usual worsening. Um, of, um, but most important thing is that we have to rule out, we have to be, de be definite about TB meningitis, which unfortunately is not always not always easy, because you know the the the, the, the culture takes time. Uh, the the um, AFB is seen only in 10 to 20 percent of cases, so we have to use uh, our judgment, and we have to rule out cryptococcal meningitis. You know, in all the cases, we do cryptococcal antigen and make sure that we do not miss the cryptococcal for tuberculosis. Great. Uh, Suzanne, any, any comments on your, your paradoxical management? Uh, yes. So it depends on what the paradoxical reaction is. So if you have just regularly followed someone with a mass lesion up to, to make sure that it's disappearing, then, and you see a paradoxical enlargement, I agree um, with Prof. Mesra, you, you don't necessarily have to treat it. What I do think is if you didn't have an initial um, uh, proven drug susceptible um, TB diagnosis, then you should look for um, drug resistance via other samples if possible. If the patient does, however, have clinical deterioration, um, I, 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 and I agree with Prof. Mr. are looking for other causes as well. If, you know, you should see if there isn't an additional infection or condition causing it. Um, if not, and the patient has had drug susceptible TB to start off with, steroids is a good place to start. And, um, but unfortunately, and this is being described quite nicely by the group from uh, Van Tuen from Stellenbosch, they see a, quite a, a large portion of children who have very fulminant cerebral abscesses as a um, paradoxical TB reaction. And they've had good um, effects with thalidomide, uh, anti-TNF drug, 
given at three to five milligram per kilogram a day. And uh, I think they are, if they haven't done recently, I've checked and I haven't seen it, but they will soon be um, publishing larger um, um, cohorts of patients and their success with that. So if the patient is not responsive to steroids, and I would say you go up to your initial steroid dose. Um, Prof. Mizra say they use 0.5. I, I, like I said, we use 1.5 and taper it according to clinical response. You might need to increase it, or if there's a rapid response, you can keep, it, keep them on, a, on this, um, the starting dose for a few weeks to a month, and then gradually reduce it. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Reinhardt. Um, um, is there, could you kind of just expand upon the role of fluoroquinolones uh, in CNS-TB? Yes. Um, that's an interesting one. So in our relatively small study, we did not see a benefit of the, of the uh, fluoroquinolones um, and no relation between exposure, let's say, the, the, to moxifloxacin. Um, so in the large study from Vietnam, the combination of levofloxacin and a very mild increase in rifampicin in a subgroup of INH-resistant patients um, uh, seemed beneficial. It's hard to prove that it doesn't help. Huh? I must say uh, in the Netherlands, it's rare, a rare entity. And if a patient reaches the ICU in our hands, we will use IV drugs and I will give IV moxifloxacin in a slightly higher dose because the moxifloxacin, so I give 600 because, because of rifampicin, the exposure to uh, moxifloxacin is a bit lower. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, the data really, the only, you know, good data would suggest an INH resistance and that there may be a benefit yeah. um, at present, but certainly there are uh, use. I'm very sorry, but I promised my wife to join her. So yes. unless there's an urgent question to me, I'll give priority to my wife, if, as you understand. But uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Reinhardt, for joining today. Okay, well, it was a pleasure. And uh, goodbye, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, uh, Reinhardt. So another uh, couple of questions about um, uh, tuberculomas, which I think we all sort of agree that they're kind of challenging. So um, what's your follow-up management, uh, maybe um, Suzanne or others, um, uh, for the tuberculomas, how long will, will the lesion uh, stay present on imaging in the brain? And um, what do you do with your drug management uh, in those cases? Okay, so um, in a study that we've done in... Um, as it in, we saw that, you know, half of patients that had two scans, at least two scans at our um, institute um, for tuberculomas, had persistent tuberculomas at the, the end of conventional treatment. So it is something that will um, take a long time and it can take years. It can take up to four years. And I know there's different opinions on how to treat. Some um, experts feel more than 18 months of treatment, of, of TB treatment, have no benefit. Others feel you should continue until the lesion disappears. The problem is that because of new vascularization, lesions can continue to enhance after they calcify. So it, it's sometimes a difficult call, and I don't think there's an answer to it. Um, also, with regards to what drugs to use, again, there's no evidence to say um, you should, for example, if someone's been already on the continuation phase to go back to your four drug regimen. I think that's something that we need to look at in future studies. Great, and um, Professor um, Oshek, uh, any perspectives from Sudan of how you would manage people with tuberculosis? Okay, uh, thanks very much. I. Uh, from my experience of around 20 years managing tuberculomata, I agree with Susan. We have to treat till the lesion either becomes wholly calcified or it disappears. Because if you stop treatment prematurely, these lesions might become active again. Not only this, we noticed patients who are having pulmonary and other types of extra pulmonary tuberculosis. When they start treatment, Tuberculomata might appear in the brain and they usually present with seizures and focal um, symptoms. So not only pulmonary tuberculosis or extra pulmonary in other sites, that needs to be treated adequately 
and to follow up the tuberculoma until they either become calcified. Even if we have patients who continue to two years on treatment, the answer is difficult. We don't have enough data to say where to go, but I think we go with patients on individual basis, but the guideline is either it disappears or it clearly calcifies. As Professor Sudan mentioned, so that is the, the enhancement will continue because the vascularization and revascularization. So clinical plus disappearance or change. And also treat if there's co-infection somewhere else, not co-infection with other bug, but tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, particularly in the military cases. I don't have many, I don't have much experience with HIV positive patients and the use of heart as well. So probably if you comment um, uh, Susan, on, on, on how long will comparing patients who are on highly active antiretroviral treatment and any change and manipulation of this antituberculous therapy. Regarding abscesses, in many of the patients, we managed to treat the patients only medically. I have seen so many patients with tuberculous abscesses, which were treated only medically, but few of them we needed to ask the surgeons to drain the abscess and continue anti tuberculous therapy. And regarding the steroids, we use one milligram per kg. We are in between, not very small dose and not the very high dose. So one milligram does work four weeks initially. Then we change over into tapering by around five milligrams every month till the lesion, as I said. Sometimes we need to use IV methylprednisolone pulse if the patient have severe iris reaction because for example, if they develop hydrocephalus, or we see new tuberculomata are appearing. So it's not only anti-tuberculous. I don't think this is microbial. Um, antimicrobial on their own will work. And the steroids themselves close the blood-brain barrier. So unless you use massive dose initially with this reaction, you give a steroids or a small dose, I think it's going to reduce the penetration of other medications into the central nervous system. Hence, the reaction might increase. This is my own um, approach. And I think it has been working very well. I don't know what others think about it. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's great. I think um, you know there's a lot of questions on tuberculomas, which I think kind of you know sort of reflects that they're they're challenging clinical situations. Um, another question that, that came up was um, when you see arachnoid uh, um what um, what do you do about that? What's your manage? How does your management change? I, I don't I don't know if I um, understand the question correctly. I think wasn't clear. Uh, is the question sh should you change the drug regimen or the duration or I, I'm not sure what the question is, but it, just in short, I don't think you change your management. You change you treat the patient as CNS TB, which I think is is similar for all forms, maybe except for for the duration of tuberculomas that's longer in some settings than for um, TBM. So for arachnoiditis, I will give the standard regimen with steroids. Okay, um, and then a couple of questions on, on diagnosis to circle back to diagnosis. So uh, one question was about adenosine deaminase in the CSF. And so this is something that, that we haven't used in Uganda because we don't have access to it, in, nor in, really in the US, but there's you know, a fair amount of data out of Turkey historically and, and elsewhere on using adenosine deaminase as a diagnostic. And so do anyone, does anyone use that or any, any perspectives on that among the panelists or, or others? In our HIV, high HIV setting, we find that it's not helpful because it can be raised with lymphoma, with cryptococcus meningitis, with other things as well. So we don't use it because it doesn't contribute, but maybe others have a different perspective. Yeah, others in sort of HIV negative populations? Any comments? Okay. Uh, let's see, other questions, we've hit most, a lot of the questions. Um, Suzanne, you know this. Um, so question on um, high dose rifampin, is it, is it better if it's given IV versus oral? Do you wanna talk about the conversion between oral and IV? Yeah, well, so um, uh, um, the Renut study did show that IV benefited, whereas um, the Whites trial did not show any, um, 
uh, a similar mortality benefit when 15 milligrams was given oral. And the Van Krivel study or uh, Ruslami study showed that 13 milligrams IVI was um, associated with mortality benefit. I, I think um, we'll have to wait for the trials results to see if increasing the rifampicin to very high, like 35 milligram per kilogram, does result in mortality benefit. It's clear, it clearly has shown that it increases or decreases this time for um, sputum conversion to negative. So it is, it was safe and it was well tolerated and it did seem to, or did, it did show to decrease the, the mycobacterial load. But whether it's going to make a difference in TBM, I think we need to wait for the results. David, I don't know what you think. You're part of our trial. Yeah. So in general, so the IV to oral sort of bioavailability is about 60%. Um, and so it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. And so the 35 milligrams per kilo orally is about 20 milligrams per kilo IV. So, so it's not a, a direct conversion. So, um, so presumably once you get into the body, it's all the same drug. It's just, you know, how much is absorbed. Um, other questions? Well, maybe um, I think we've hit on most of the questions from the audience or the themes of the questions. Um, maybe the last question that um, uh, Jerome Chen asks is, should, should TB meningitis be declared a neglected tropical disease to increase awareness for funding of research and treatment? It might be a slightly uh, biased panel. If, if you allow me to, to respond to this. I think I think uh, tuberculosis of the nervous system, not only TB meningitis, post disease and, and other manifestations. I think they are should be pushed towards being considered of the neglected disease in WHO, because we have very prevalent disease within particularly internally displaced and the refugee community, and these people they don't have much facilities and very underdeveloped and they have malnutrition, they have vitamin deficiencies. Even we give patients with anti-tuberculosis, we give them food and we give them multivitamins with the, with the medications, not very high doses because you know INH cause peripheral neuropathy, but these are malnourished patients. So unless there is a campaign of trying to prevent tuberculosis and treat them adequately and treat them early through the WHO, I don't think local governments will, will, will be able to afford that. I think we should work towards tuberculosis of the nervous system being recognized as part of the international campaign against tuberculosis as a neglected disease. And that will give a lot of um, budget and a lot of facilities, probably mobile units for diagnosis or new PCR kits for the poor countries. I think we should make a consortium towards pushing for this direction. And that will prevent a lot of cases. Rather than talking about sophisticated tests in the CSF and on all these microbiological tests, which are important, but prevention on the long term, prevention in the targeted population might be the way forward. That's my own concept, having lived in, in these environments myself. And so how people are, are, it's not going to stop. The disease will increase. Thank you. Great. I think the, the saying, the, well, the American saying, or maybe it's a British saying, is that an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. And so I think that's about 30 grams versus a half a kilo um, in metric terms. But I, I think the concept of prevention certainly is much easier than, than treating disease after it's, it's uh, taken place. So I think um, we're sort of at our time and a little bit over our, our time today. And I think that hopefully that um, the the audience uh, has uh, learned quite a bit uh, from the, the panelists and uh, the speakers today that were uh, exceptional uh, global experts in uh, TB meningitis. And um, Suzanne, as a moderator, do you want to do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Yes, I would like to thank everyone who contributed and for Dr. Mishram to ask me. And David, thank you very much for being chair and Kate for presenting our case and all the other speakers for your contribution. I think it was a great session. Thanks very much. And Dr. Mishram. Thank you, uh, all the speakers, Dr. Suzan, Dr. Oshik, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Renard, uh, Dr. Kate, and uh, for excellently chairing the session, uh, Dr. David, and uh, our invited uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Rashakir, Shakir, 
प्रोफेसर ग्रिसवाल डॉक्टर सरोज कात्रक डॉक्टर अगस्टीना द नेक्स्ट सेशन वी हैव ऑन सेवनटीन अक्टूबर सेम टाइम एंड डॉक्टर फ्रांसिस्को कार्डेसो फ्रॉम ब्राजील विल स्पीक ऑन मूवमेंट डिसऑर्डर्स एंड इन्फेक्शन क्रिस्टिना मारा विल स्पीक ऑन न्यूरोसिफिलिस ऑस्कर डेल पेट्रो from ecuador will present a case and larissa from brazil will also present a case and the session will be chaired by ricardo nitrini from brazil and uh, professor kailash bhatia from uk so it is going to be another uh, cracker of a session very interesting session uh, next week and uh, i would like to thank again all the presenters and uh, the audience for large participation and uh, i hope you enjoyed it was a great session uh, thank you very much thank you diva bye bye thank you bye to everybody thank you